just said. My name is Jacob, and I work here in Beach Students, and I'm so excited to be uh, in this series called Remain. Uh, we're going book by book, verse by verse, through the book of Daniel. Um, it's an Old Testament book. It's a lot of scripture, uh, but I'm really excited about it because, truthfully, this book, the main theme is remaining in your faith, even when the circumstances around you tell you not to. And last week, Rachel talked about this guy Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and their life was ruined. Um, This guy came in and wiped out their whole nation, stole all their resources, killed a bunch of people, and then was like, hey, I'm not going to kill you, but I am going to imprison you uh, because you're handsome and strong and capable, and I want you to become a Babylonian citizen so that you can make my empire better. And so, not a deal. And These boys could have sat in their captivity and said, well, God has given up on us. He didn't protect us from these people. Uh, He's put me in this horrible situation. These people are about to strip me of my identity as an Israelite and make me something that I'm not. What's the point? But instead, they remain in their faith. They trust in God and they obey the things that God has told them to do, so they only eat the food that God tells them to eat, and he blesses them for it. He makes them more capable, and um, they get promoted. They, they outshine the rest of the people at this, like, work camp prison thing, and it's awesome. They trust God. God shows up and is faithful. And then in the next chapter, chapter 2, the king's throwing a temper tantrum because he had a dream, and he doesn't know what it's about, and so he's just going to kill everyone, like a normal reaction to that scenario. And the boys could have, uh, just like everyone else, gone and sought knowledge and wisdom elsewhere. They had resources to, like, all of these different nations, um, top scholars, because Babylon had just collected all of it. And they could have gone and tried to find the answers um, in the world's research, just like everyone else. But instead, they sat and they remained and they prayed together and they sought God together. And God blessed them with the interpretation of the dream. And so um, then they get promoted again. It's this beautiful story of like, when you remain with God, he blesses you. And that's really awesome. But it's hard to remain. Like, it is not easy to be obedient. It's not easy to worship the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like, that's hard. And like, it's one thing to read about it in scripture, and it's another to live it day to day. And so chapter three um, is a lot more about how difficult it is to remain. And you know this story. Um, If you grew up in church at all, if you went to kids camp or VBS, or if you watched Veggie Tales, um, shout out Veggie Tales. Um, But for real, uh, you know this story. It's got a blazing furnace in it. And as soon as I said that, a lot of you in the room were like, cool, I already know this story. And you can check out. That is an option. Um, I've read this story probably over 100 times. And even in prepping for tonight, like, I learned something new. And so the thing I want to challenge you with is this isn't just a story that you tell little kids. This is, like, a real thing that happened. And it has the power to change how you live and to make your life better. And if you've never heard this story before... I'm a little bit jealous because I would love to hear this story again for the first time and get to witness the insanity that is this event. Um, But we're going to get, we're just going to start in verse 1, so we'll get right into it. Chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefix, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefix, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Now, who knows how tall 60 cubits is? Somebody tell me. Shout it out. Nice. Some people heard me earlier. It's 90 feet tall. Um, 90 feet is like one of those numbers where you hear 90 feet and you're like, I could imagine 90 feet, um, but I have a picture. I have something better. This is a real statue that is 90 feet tall that exists in our world today. 
It's called the Our Lady of the Rockies. It's an insane title. Uh, this statue literally just like peeks out over like where two mountains meet and it just like looks over a city. It's kind of terrifying. But it's 90 feet tall. And there's a couple pictures where like I guess helicopters went by and took shots of it. And when people stand down here, they look like little cockroaches trying to climb up on her dress. It's terrifying how big this statue is. But um, this is a visual representation of how tall this gold statue was. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. How much gold does it take to make a 90-foot tall statue? A lot of gold. I don't know. I didn't do math. But the reason the king can do this is because he's flexing. He's like, look at all the gold that I stole from all these nations that I conquered. It's disposable income. I'll just build a statue of myself 90 feet tall out of gold. It's a flex of wealth. And then on top of that, the height indicates this idea of power. Like, it's 90 feet tall. You can't just, like, look at it and be like, oh, that's a nice statue. You have to, like, look at it. You have to, like, lean back. You have to look at it from a distance. The statue just towers over and looks down on people. It's a reminder of his power. And it's also a reminder of authority. It's in the image of the king, the most influential person in the kingdom. And so all these people are gathered around looking at this flex of wealth, power, and authority. And included in those people, because they got promoted so many times, is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're just looking at a statue that represents the guy who wiped out their entire nation. And I think sometimes we just hear about a statue being built, and that's it. But like, this would be terrifying to look at the representation of the person who ruined your life, just towering over you. Verse 4, then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down in worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Of course, you bow, right? The command is super simple. You worship the king or you die. And like I said, there's a lot of people that are in this like governing group that aren't just natural born Babylonian citizens. So everyone is bowing for one reason or another. There are the Babylonians that are so hyped that their king is conquering the known world right now. Their team is winning. They believe in this. They love their king. So they're gladly bowing down because they believe in what is happening. And then there's the people who are in charge that got captured and had to be a part of this against their will. And they're bowing out of fear because this guy took everything from them and he will do it again. And they're looking at this image that reminds them of that power and that authority. And we don't, we don't like bow to stuff culturally. Um, we don't bow to officials or um, to people with um, positions of authority, but we do bow to something every single day. There is something that sits in the center of your life that controls your thoughts, your actions, your words, controls how you spend your time, how you spend your money, controls how you treat the people around you, who you spend time with in general. There is something that dictates and rules over your life and you bow to it, whether you chose that thing or whether it over time crept into the center of your life. And some of us, some of us bow to it because we believe in that thing, right? Like for a lot of people, um, the thing that sits at the center of their life is them, right? Like it's about me. I am the best. I have to take care of me. And so everything I do is to service me. Some people still um, believe in, in this and it's perceived as a good thing, but they put their significant other in the center of their life. And so all their thought, time, money, words, actions go to that person, that significant other. And it's because they love them, right? Like 
I, why would I not spend all my time and money with that person? Why would I not schedule my life around this person? Why would I not like stay awake thinking about them into all hours of the night? Because I love them. That's a good thing. They should be the center of my life. And then you have people who bow to things out of fear. Fear and anxiety tells us a lot of the times that if we're not successful, then we're not good enough. So we chase success out of fear of failure. Or we chase popularity and being liked and influenced because if certain people don't like us, then we're not good enough. And so there's something for each of us that sits at the center of our life and we bow to it every day whether we chose that thing or not. And we continue in verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now, these guys do not like the fact that Israelite outsiders have positions of power. So there's a little bit of jealousy, a little bit of tattletaling going on right here. Um, and if you remember from the first two chapters, the king likes Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They have proven themselves to the king. And so these guys also in power do not like that the king likes them. It's this whole thing. So they are like, oh, this is our chance. We've, we've found our way to get rid of them. Now, the question becomes... Why was it so easy for them to figure that out? How did they know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't worshiping? Well, uh, Tyler, could you stand up for me? Tyler has no idea what I'm doing. Cool. You can cheer for Tyler. Um, Tyler, you're just, yeah, you're just going to stand there. So in a time where normally everyone sits and looks at the person on stage who's talking, um, Tyler is awkwardly standing, surrounded by people who are sitting. And the more you think about it, the more awkward it kind of feels, and it's super obvious. Like, the rest of us are doing what's normal at this time. I'm up here, you're over there, sitting in chairs. And if somebody walked in, I, I'm not the thing that they notice first, even though, like, common sense might think that's the case because I have lights on me. I don't like that, but they are. They're going to notice Tyler being the only person standing in the room. And the longer it happens, the more obvious it is. You can sit, Tyler. Thank you so much. So last, <laughs> he was about to like really own that. So last week, Rachel talked about being set apart, talked about taking risks in order to remain in our faith. Here's the thing about being set apart. Set apart people stand out. Set apart people don't look like the people around them. Set apart people painfully obvious that they don't look like the people around them. And it can be really hard to remain in your faith when you feel like you're the only person standing and everyone else is sitting. That's an incredibly awkward feeling. Remain when you stand out. Remain when you stand out. It's hard to remain, but remain even when you stand out. The question is not, am I going to stand out? You're going to stand out if you're set apart if your life looks different than the world around you. And if you are someone who says, I believe in Jesus, and I've given my life to him, and you ask yourself, does my life look any different than the lives of the people around me? And the answer is no. Then perhaps you're not set apart. Perhaps you are not standing out. Perhaps you haven't remained. And that's not a judgment thing or a shameful thing. That's a self-reflecting question that is really hard to answer. Because if we're honest... We rarely look different than the world around us. Remain when you stand out. See, these boys saw what the rest of the world was worshiping. It was this inanimate object, this statue. And that the statue, it represented a person, a person who had taken everything from them, who thought he had all the power and authority, but even in the midst of him thinking he controlled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
their God was faithful to them. Their God provided what they needed for a promotion. Their God protected them in the midst of turmoil. And so they recognized he's not worthy of our worship. Only my God is. And so we continue in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image that I created... Very good. He's giving them a chance. Technically, the law was if you don't worship, you just go right in the furnace. There's not a trial. There's not a questioning period. But he likes them. So he's like, if you want to just do it right now, then we're good. Slate's clean. We'll go back to doing what we're doing. I'll have a statue. You'll work for me. It's awesome. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown into the fire immediately. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. This is a statement from someone who truly thinks that they have the power and they have the authority. And the world wants you to think that it has all the power and it has all the authority. And so it's going to question you. Right now, three teenage slash young adult men are being interrogated by the most powerful person in the region, the king who took everything from them. And he's putting into question if what they believe is really worth it. And here's the thing. When you are set apart, when you stand out, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when people will question you. And it won't be nice questions like, oh, tell me about what you're doing. That's that's intriguing to me. Teach me, learn me some. No, it's going to be mean questions. Like, do you hate me? Do you think you're better than me? Are you stupid? Do you have any idea how dumb you sound right now? You really believe in a fairy tale? Like, these are the types of questions that come from the world. Remain when you are questioned. You're going to be questioned. If you stand out, if you're set apart, people are going to question it. Because, again, it's super obvious to see whose life looks different than those around them. And people don't like that. The world doesn't like that. You will be questioned. Remain when you are questioned. And that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do. They could have argued, but instead in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. There's no need to debate. See, standout people don't stand out because they shout their opinion the loudest. Set apart people don't stand out because they think they're better than the people that they're surrounded by. Set apart people don't stand out because they judge people who don't live or believe what they believe. Set apart people stand out because their lives look different and they've put their trust in God. And so in verse 17, they continue If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and will deliver us from your majesty's hand. This is a statement, my God can and my God will. To the king, my God can and my God will. And this underline, take a picture of it, verse 18, whatever you got to do. But even if he does not, even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. This is not a statement that comes from three guys who just like believe that God exists. This is a statement of people who have put their trust in God's life and have seen his faithfulness. A lot of the times we wonder why God hasn't shown up, why God hasn't been faithful, why we haven't seen his power, his goodness. It's because we haven't given our lives to him. We believe in him, but we still hold our lives. We're in control. We're doing what we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it. So where is God supposed to work in that? It'd be like your little sibling saying, can I play a game on your phone? 
and you're like, I don't know. I really think you might break my phone. It's a brand new phone. I don't want you to drop it. It makes me really nervous. And they're like, I promise I'll sit on the couch. I'll be really still. I'll hold it with two hands. I won't break it. I promise. And you say, I trust you. And then you put your phone in your pocket and you walk away. You don't really trust them in that moment. You might believe them, but you don't trust them until you hand over your phone and let them show you if they're trustworthy or not. God isn't going to show up in your life if you're still holding on to your life. He's waiting for you to say, do you trust me? Do you trust that when I'm in control, that it will be better? And this is why they're able to make this statement, because they truly believed from what they have seen, from what they have heard, that God is good. And they didn't have to worry about it. They didn't have to fight. God was going to take care of them. So then in verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trouser, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three, firmly tied, fell into the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no way of knowing what was going to happen. We have the benefit of hindsight. Oh, this is in the Bible. There's probably a good lesson and a good ending where God does something cool. Like, even if you've never heard the story before, you can kind of see where this is all going. But like, what, when we're living life, we don't know what God's going to do. We don't know what life is throwing at us. It's easy right now to sit in a chair and be like, yeah, I trust God. And then when life actually happens and we have no idea what's coming next, it's a lot different. And see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are literally falling into the furnace. That's where their remaining brought them, to the point where they're going to get burned, where they're going into the fire. It's not a matter of, like, God, can you, like, make the furnace not happen? They're falling into it right now. Remain when it costs you something. Remain when it costs you something. It's hard to remain, and it's going to cost you something. It might cost you what you believe is the best thing for your life. It might cost you what you want. It might cost you something that you've been holding on to for a long time, good or bad, but God never said that it was for you. Remain when it costs you something. See, it costs these three everything to remain. Literally, they were being dropped into a furnace. And their statement of faith was still, my God can, my God will, but even if he doesn't, he's worthy of my worship and you are not. Remain even when it costs you something. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. Which, side note, you agree with the king no matter what. Like, you, don't, you never question him. So they're going to say yes. Verse 25, he said, look, I see four men walking in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So the three of them came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a, head, a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. When was the last time you got within five feet of a campfire? and walked away smelling free of smoke? The answer to that question is never, because it's literally impossible. As soon as you get close to fire for any amount of time, your clothes linger with the scent of smoke. 
and you have to shower like four times before it doesn't transfer to your sheets and your pillow for the next three nights. Like smoke invades your space and just like kind of takes over. These three come out of the fire and not only are they unbound, so they are set free, they are unsinged, unscorched, and they are smoke free. That's insane that they were protected so completely. And not only that, but God doesn't save them from a distance and remove himself from the situation. He's literally in the fire with them. He is right there beside them like he had been the entire time. And a lot of times I think we wait until we're in the furnace to be like, hey, God, are you going to show up? And we forget to remain in the process that leads up to that moment. We're so focused on the moment of pain and suffering and consequence, and we haven't remained missing God along the way when he was there the whole time. So then when we're in the fire, of course we miss him as well. The question is, are you willing to remain? Are you willing to remain even when you stand out, when you're questioned, when it costs you something? Are you willing to remain? God didn't take away the furnace. He met them in there. But he protected them from it so completely that they didn't even smell like smoke. 28, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that any people of any nation or language who says anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble. Dramatic much? A little bit. This is important. Underline this, write this down, take a picture of it, something. For no other God can save in this way. For no other God can save in this way, in this complete way, where they're untouched by the situation around them. Where there's no evidence that they even went through the furnace except for the fact that everyone saw it. No other God can save in this way. And then verse 30 The king promotes them again because that's kind of what happens at the end of all of these chapters, I guess. They were so willing, they were so willing to trust God and give up their lives rather than serve or worship any other God. They trusted God and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship anything else. Why? Because they saw what the world offered And they experienced what God offered. And nothing came close to being worthy of their worship as God did. God was the only thing that could save them so completely. The statue was doing nothing at this time. The king was the one who put them in there in the first place. And that's what everyone else was bowing down to. That's where they thought the power and authority was. And it shifts real quick when they see how completely God rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, last week was Easter, and Easter is the culmination of this story that God starts all the way at the beginning of time, where he creates out of love, and he has these beautiful creations that are are close and dear to him, and it's us, humanity. And then humanity decides they don't need God, so they separate from him. And then there's this unrepairable gap. There's nothing that you or I could do to get back into a relationship with God. We could no longer remain with him, even if we wanted to, we were on the outside. And God knew there was nothing we could do. And so he said, I love you so much that I'm going to earth. And as Jesus, I am going to walk around and I'm gonna show you what it looks like when you remain in me. I'm gonna show you the benefit of obedience to God. I'm gonna show you what's possible when you worship him, when he's the center of your life. And then he dies. And we don't worship Jesus. We don't follow him and all he taught because he died. Everyone does that. We make Jesus the king of our lives, the only one worthy of worship because he rose again after saying he was going to. And then when he rose again, it wasn't just to be like, 
I guess I can do that because I love God more and good luck to the rest of you. He offered us a chance to be whole again, to make Jesus king again, and to remain again. And so we just celebrated that incredible account in our faith story. And now the invitation is the same. Jesus wants to be the center of your life. He wants to be the king of your life. He has seen the things that we have decided to bow to. And he knows those things can't save you. Those things are going to lead to more situations that you are not going to be pleased with. And he just extends the offer to be the center of your life, to be the thing that is worthy of your worship. And so remaining is hard. A lot of us in this, sorry, a lot of us in this room, Jesus was the center of our life at one point. And something else has crept in. And we've, we've let something else take the center of our life from Jesus. And it controls our thoughts, our actions, our words, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, how we treat people. And some of us, have never even made the choice to make Jesus king. And then there's some of us who have remained and who do look set apart. They stand out. And no matter where you are in this room, the invitation is the same. It's remain. Remain. In John 15, Jesus says, Remain in me as I remain in you. He is faithful, he is good, and you will 100% get to see that when you put your life in his hands. And so the first thing that I want to address is the people in the room who have never made Jesus their Lord and Savior, who never made him king, who have never given their life to Jesus before, however you want to say it. If you're in here tonight and you're just feeling, you don't know what, you recognize that something feels different and something about making Jesus the center of your life sounds like what you're supposed to do. Even if you don't fully know what that means or have your life all together, newsflash, none of us did when we gave our lives to Jesus. We're all a mess. Like, if you're even like slightly considering this thing, I want to extend an invitation to you. And so everyone's going to close their eyes and bow their heads. And if that's you tonight, I just ask you to raise your hand even just a little bit so I know who I'm praying for. If you want to make Jesus the center of your life for the first time, if you want to acknowledge him as the only one who can save as completely as he does, then raise your hand. And we're just going to say a prayer together. And it's not the words that I'm saying or the fact that I'm saying it into a microphone that means anything. It's you talking to God. And your prayer can be something like this, and you can pray this with me. Dear God, I need you tried so many other things and they've fallen short. I don't have everything together. I don't even know fully what this is all about, but I know I need you. Be close to me as I seek to be close to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If that was you, I would love to meet you as soon as worship starts. I just want to give you a gift, answer any questions you have. Um, and just follow up with you. So like, if that was you, I'd love to meet you in the back. But for the rest of us, for those of us who have remained and would say that we're set apart, we are about to enter into God's presence where we just get to be with him. We get to worship him for who he is and all that he has done. But there are also those of us in this room. And Jesus was the center of our life and he isn't anymore. And so at any point during worship, it does not have to be the first song. It could literally be three seconds before the host come back up to close tonight. But if you're ready to make Jesus the center of your life again, to acknowledge him as the only person worthy of your worship, then I want to invite you down to the altar. And again, there's literally nothing special about these pieces of wood that somebody built for us. But there is something special about the posture that we take when we approach 
God's presence. And you can just come down and kneel. And while you're down here, it's a space to leave the idol that you've been worshiping, that you've been bowing down to, whether out of fear or whether because you truly believed it was worthy of your worship. And you can just recommit right here. And you can tell Jesus, like, I want you to be king again. I wanna worship you and you alone. You are the only one that I want. So at any point during worship, if that's you, come find a space at the altar. We're gonna pray and head into worship. Dear God, thank you for being a God who saves. Thank you for loving us so much that you wouldn't leave us where we were, that you love us so much that you would seek us as thoroughly as you did. Thank you that you are the only thing worthy of our worship. God, help us to remain even when we stand out, even when we're questioned, even when it costs us something. It's all for you. It's always been for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The last thing I'll say, it's really difficult to remain on your own. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three people. And I guarantee you, if it was just Meshach, he'd have a lot harder time standing up to the king. But because he had people in his life that were also willing to remain, it made it a lot easier. And so for you guys, whatever that action step is that you need to take, whether it's come down, whether it's for the first time follow Jesus, don't do it alone. And you're gonna hate how this sounds, but I promise you, you'll never forget it. Who will you have been to go to? Who will you have been to go to? I won't say it again. I will say, for real though, who will you trust to call you out and say, hey, you stopped remaining. Hey, you're living for yourself again. Hey, are you sure that's God's best for your life? And I, and here's the disclaimer, it's probably not gonna be someone else who's struggling to remain right now. That's still a great person in your life that you can be friends with, but maybe not hold you accountable. You need to find someone who stands out, who's set apart and has decided to remain. And I always say life group leaders, but that's because we pick life group leaders as people who are remaining in their faith, who stand out for what they believe and do the, the volunteer role that they do, they're there for you. Maybe your parents pursue Jesus with everything they have. Ask them to hold you accountable. Maybe there's someone in your grade that like drastically stands out in their faith. Find them. Find someone who will go alongside you. Don't do this alone. Love you guys.